Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you that you are a God that fills our life with grace, that you fill our world with grace, Lord, that you, that you are a God far bigger than, than the world around us and far bigger than the things that we face, God. We thank you, Lord, that there is power in your name. God, that there is power in your name, the kind of power that we can rest on. Thank you for that. Lord God, it is only your name. It is only your name that has that power. Father, we are your people. And we love being your people. Father God, we can sing that forever. Lord, we can sing that forever. Our desire is for you to dwell closer to us in increased measure. Lord, that we would be a people that would move from strength to strength and glory to glory, that we wouldn't stay in the same place we were yesterday. That our tomorrows would be brighter and bigger and fuller because of you. Because of you, Father. Because of the victory that we can find in you, God. The victory and the strength. Oh God. Oh God. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you are a great God. That you are a great God, Father. And as we prepare to hear the message today, Lord, I ask that you would just do a work in our hearts, God. Continue to do a work in our hearts, Lord that we might see more of you, that we might understand more of you and more of your ways. Keep opening up this world to us, God. the secrets of this world. Lord, we partner with you. We partner with you in bringing heaven to this earth, bringing heaven to, to the broken places. Reveal yourself to us, Father. We thank you for that, Lord, in your almighty name. Let's just pray together. Father, I thank you for children. I thank you, Father, for the joy of the Lord that has been in both, both Jeremy and Ellie. We thank you, Father, for the joy that is in them, that flows from them and touches the lives and the hearts of the people around. Even, Lord, the, the simple fact that they just walk to the front of the church and as people are seen, and the children taking up offering, Lord, joy has met them. And I pray, Father, that this very day, that your joy will be seen as strength in our children. May it be seen through our kids' church and our leaders of kids' church. We thank you for the opportunity to give through our tithes and offerings. Lord, you are a faithful God. We continue, Lord, to see your faithfulness through all the provisions that you bring into our world here through this church. And we say thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. a few things on church news before we um, uh, jump into the rest of the service and communion. So this week we've had uh, a couple of people who've passed away um, in the church. Uh, today we're supposed to be um, we're supposed to be dedicating baby baby Jackson's uh, Louise and um, Justin's baby, and uh, Justin's grandfather passed away yesterday. And so uh, I let him know that we'd be praying for him this morning and just uh, supporting the family. But also this week, if you haven't been aware, and most people have, um, Bet Johnson passed away on Wednesday night. Now, Bet is our longest serving uh, church member. And, um, and on Wednesday night, she uh, got home and uh, made herself a cup of tea and put some chicken in the oven and sat down for a cup of tea and just went to be with Jesus. And, um, and so in the morning, they found some very, very cooked chicken, uh, a very cold cup of tea, sewing still in a lap. And, uh, and she's with Jesus. Uh, so lots of, and myself included, I've known Bet for um, over 35 years, and uh, she is just such a, uh, such an encourager. Uh, through all the years that uh, I've been doing things in and through this church, and she was a cheeky one. There is no doubt about that, and she liked being cheeky, and we loved the concept that she was cheeky. Uh, I grew up knowing her as the cool one uh, of our of our elderly folk, and um, my kids have grown up knowing that she's the calling her the cool one, 
as well. Uh, so she will be greatly missed. So the funeral will be this Friday here at church and uh, everyone is welcome to be, be here. Uh, if you are able to be here, and uh, because there's a bunch of things that we have to get happening um, from uh, worship teams and projector systems and sound systems and welcoming and all that sort of stuff. If you are coming and you'd like to help and serve, just come and have a chat with me after the service and I'm sure we can get something something arranged. Uh, there will be a, another service at the crematorium at 3.15 and again everyone is welcome to that but that will be uh, very much just a committal service. Uh, but so when on Friday at one o'clock will be a Thanksgiving service here for Bet Bet Johnson. And so be thinking of all the people in our church too, particularly those who've known Bet for a long time and for some of you guys it's been a lifetime. And uh, she will be greatly missed. I, I met with her family yesterday and uh, the shock of, of it all, like she's, not, I think she was 92, uh, she was still babysitting grandkids and actively doing it every day. And so she'd get in the car and drive to wherever the kids were and if they were playing football she'd be there wherever they were. Uh, she just didn't want to stop and uh, she's just a brilliant, brilliant woman of God. So I thought we just might take a moment just to pray for both uh, Justin's family and and also Beth's family, uh, and just ask the Father just to comfort. So if you'd just like to pray with me, just to allow your spirit to pray with mine, um, allow your imagination to see what Jesus is doing uh, and, and how he comforts. And so, Father, we just want to say thank you, uh, firstly, for Justin's grandfather. I didn't know the guy personally, but I just know how much Justin loved him. And I want to pray just such a peace down upon Justin and his family today. I know it wasn't a shock for them, but at the same time, Father, there's a huge gap that is now in, in, in their family. I just want to pray peace and comfort over Justin's family. And Jesus, I pray that through us, uh, that we can uh, physically comfort him as well. Father, also we thank you for Beth. Uh, so many years of doing so many wonderful things here in this church. So encouraging, uh, such a great sense of humor. And I just thank you, Father, for her desire just to, just to uh, be with your people here in this church. I thank you for uh, her family. And I just want to pray that right now, that wherever they are, Jesus, that your peace will meet them and comfort them and encourage them. And I pray that come Friday, Lord, that it will be such a wonderful time of thanksgiving uh, where grief is able to be uh, spoken and shared and encountered. But at the same time, may your healing be here as well. And we just say thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so other than that, just with church news, uh, we are still raising funds to send Naomi and I on to, uh, to Lebanon on, in mission. And so there's a plate at the back of the church with envelopes. I know a bunch of you guys have taken envelopes. If you can start bringing those back sooner rather than later, because we've got to start paying for some of the things that we're doing. Uh, that would be awesome. Uh, as far as church news, we've got uh, Easter coming up, and so we've got a Good Friday, uh, sorry, Easter Thursday, which will be our service of shadows. We're actually going to do a little something a little bit new with that. Uh, so if you've been coming along for year after year, uh, we're still doing a service of shadows, but it'll be just with a, a new flavour. It'll be with a Lisa flavour. Yeah, it's going to be good. And uh, then we have Good Friday morning at nine o'clock in the morning, and then we have Easter Sunday at our normal time of ten. 10.30. Other than that, welcome to church. It's great to have you here today. It's awesome to get the extra hour of sleep. Is that right? Yes. I surely enjoyed it. Uh, thank you to all those who came out last night for our extra service. Uh, it was a wonderful night in, in, in the house of God and just such a blessing to meet with so many people across so many different churches. Uh, and so it was a wonderful time. I'll speak a little bit more about that in the message. But we're going to come to a time of communion. I want to read to you just a passage of scripture as we come to this time of communion. And it comes out of Mark chapter 4. And Jesus then asked the disciples the question, Would anyone light a lamp and then put it under a basket or under a bed? Of course not. A lamp is placed on a stand where its light will shine. But everything that is hidden will eventually be brought into the open and every secret will be brought to light. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. But then he added, Pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding will be given and you will receive even more. 
To those who listen to my teaching, more, teaching, uh, more understanding will be given, but those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. When I read that, read that passage of scripture this morning and I was thinking about communion, I just, I just spent some time just in the wonder of what communion actually represents. And communion is again just one of these many ways that we have as believers in Christ to remind us ourselves of what God has actually done for us and the power of what God has actually done for us through Christ's sacrifice. In, in one man giving up his life, he's saying, if you just want to believe in this one man in, in Christ, who is God, and th then your life becomes eternal. There is a little awakening right there. And that's probably the understatement of the day. Through Christ, we can receive everlasting life. When we talk about bet, uh, being in that everlasting life, we have this confidence and assurance because of what Christ has given to us and shown to us and what we have seen with our own eyes. And, and right here, even in a passage of scripture, Jesus is saying, I've given you a light, let's not hide it. And so through the, through the communion table is a gospel message. Through the communion table we have the bread, which represents the body of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, broken on our behalf. And, and secondly, we have the grape juice, which represents the blood of Jesus Christ, which was shed so that every one of our sins could be forgiven. That's, that's why we call it good news. There is nothing that's holding us back from the Father. And so right there we just have two simple symbols, but they speak of something so profound that if we hide it, then we're actually saying to Jesus, well, it's not really necessary to share it. But Jesus is saying to us, as we are showing it today, so we are to live it in all areas of our lives. So this morning we are taking communion as we normally do. We're going to get a few people to come forward. I'm going to pray a blessing over the bread, and then we're going to share it together. So you feel free to take a piece of bread and receive it for yourself. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we say thank you for moments like this where the gospel message is given in symbol. And Father, as it is given, we believe it is given in power. And so right in this place this morning, I believe today that the people will come into a greater revelation, a greater understanding of the things that you are speaking to us through the Father in heaven. And so Lord, I just want to pray that today that you'll bless this bread to our body. In Jesus' name. Amen. The song Laura's playing is Bet Johnson's favourite song. The power of your love. That's what you're receiving this morning. The power of his love. So you're going to be served with a cup. I want you to hold on to it and we're going to drink together as the body of Christ. So on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took a cup of wine. He poured it out for all of his disciples and he said, drink. This wine represents the blood of Christ that will be shed for you. The Apostle Paul goes on to speak about how that, through that blood, would be the forgiveness of all sin. As you receive this grape juice this morning, remind yourself that Christ has set you free from every sin, every wrongdoing, past, present, and future. That's what we call grace. Drink all of it, my friends. Be thankful for what the Lord Jesus Christ has done on your behalf. Lord Jesus, we simply say thank you. Amen. And then we're going to collect the cups as well before we go. As we're doing that, maybe you'd just like to welcome someone to church that you didn't come to church with. Just say g'day. Or something more than g'day. I want to uh, speak to you this morning uh, from the Gospel of, of Mark. In particular for Mark chapter 5. We'll get to the reading in just a, a second. Last night in our extra service, I, I spoke of a conversation that I had uh, with a person in the morning. So one of the things that uh, we're currently now stepping out into as a church is with a lot of the prophetic mentoring that we're doing now is we're going online. And so this week I've been interviewing with a, quite a number of people from all over the world who want to connect in with what we're doing. And one of the fellows that we, um, I was speaking to yesterday uh, is from, I think, Phoenix, Arizona, and he said to me, uh, I love what you do, however, I want to understand what you believe. And he said, could you just explain to me what your theology is? Now, not a lot of people come across your path and say, hey, what's your theology, right? Has anyone had that happen this week? Uh, no, right? Yeah, because it, it's just not one of those things that 
that we seem to talk about, not in our day-to-day -day life, not in our uh, work life, not in our school life. People don't just have that question of, hey, can I just ask you what your theology is? Uh, but when you, when you see people wanting to step into a place of faith and belief, it's a very good question to ask, uh, to understand what a person believes. And so the concept of theology is how you understand God. That's, that's the whole thing, theology. How you under, understand God. And, and everyone in this room, if I had us all together and I had us define exactly what we understood about God, we'd all be kind of different. There would be some non-negotiable parts of that, and there'd be other parts that we go, yeah, I've actually got a different view on that particular thing. Or I've got a different view on the way that I see that God forgives me. I might have a different view on the way that God loves me. I might have a different view on God's mercy. I might have a different view on all range of things. But this is why it's so important for us as the body of Christ to hear and to listen to every single voice. Otherwise, you have been led by only one. And this is part of what I believe for us as a church. It's not about just my voice that's important in the room. Every single one of your voices is important. And when I say important, I mean necessary. Uh, because every single one of you have got beliefs, thoughts, and you've also got questions inside of it. Like there's probably nobody in the room that can say that I fully understand God. Why? Because He's, he's beyond our human understanding. The Bible says even his own peace is beyond our understanding, let alone every other part of his character. Just one part of him is beyond our understanding. And so when people come along and they say, I've got a really good handle on God, what they usually mean is they have an understanding of the way that God has interacted with their own life. But when somebody else turns up and asks a curly question, you go, oh, I'm not sure I've ever thought about that. And I don't really know what I think about some of those things. And so when this man said to me, what is my theology? That is probably the most open-ended question to ask a pastor. And you could actually be there for the rest of the day. Be careful when you ask a pastor what their theology is. <coughs> what is it that you believe about God? I was speaking to people, a couple of people this week, and um, they left church um, a while ago, left the whole concept of church. And I asked them the question, why? And they said, well, the people within it were very nasty. And you go, okay, I, I can understand that, that, that they're humans, right? But you listen to a story and they, all these years later they joke about it, but the concept of the time, it really meant something to them. And what it said to them about God wasn't helpful. It was actually quite negative. And I said, well, what does it mean that they were nasty? And, they were, and what it effectively means, they're all about laws. They're all about rules. You have to wear this when you come to church. You have to behave this way when you're at church. You're not allowed to do this when you're at church. And all, it's, all they remember of their childhood is what they could not do as far as God was concerned, rather than what they were free to do as we've just been singing. For many of us who have grown up in church uh, circles and environments, I've grown up as a pastor's kid, right? And, and there's expect, expectations that i felt on me my entire life. At times I had to, uh, at times I rebelled against, at times I got in trouble for, at times I even wore jeans to church. I know, it's ridiculous. I love my jeans. When I, I sit and listen to a story like that, my heart breaks. For that story because whatever their concept of God was is not my concept of God strangely enough it was my concept of God but it is no longer and so when, when we stand and we sing songs of, of love uh, the word love for me is such a profound word I was, I was standing there singing one of the songs, I can't remember which one it was, but we were talking about, we were singing about love, and this, this phrase came into my mind of relationships actually grow. And I started thinking about that as I was standing next to my brilliant wife, and I'm standing there next to her going, our relationship has actually grown. And the more that we've actually invested in the love that we actually carry, the greater the, the growth of the relationship. And I started thinking about that and looking around the room of all the people here that I've done life with and enjoyed doing life with and watched as the relationship grew. 
When your relationship is not growing, I think it's effectively going backwards. Because I think the design of relationship is to go from strength to strength and not just to stagnate in the one place. Even that word stagnate in the one place is not a helpful thing if you're talking about your marriage or if you're talking about your relationship. And so these concepts of my relationship with God, I'm continually asking questions of what even that looks like so that I can discover more of Him. And so when I read scriptures that we've just read this morning from from the book of Mark where it talks about more understanding will be given, that is something that I want. When I was a kid, I learned that Jesus loved me because the Bible told me so and I sang the song and I still know the song. But as an adult, I I want to be a man of God who doesn't just know that God loves me because the Bible tells me. I want to know that God loves me because I see and feel and encounter the love of God. And the Father gives me so many encounters of this kind of love. And for many of you, you have loved me as the Father has loved me. He puts his love inside of your spirits to do something with it. And I think at times it's kind of selfish if I keep that to myself. I just want to love people. I was talking to Chris as she walked in the door about the concept of nursing. And she speaks of it as a call. What that, what that means is that she, she lives it as, as, as if she's investing in it. As God has loved on her, so she is loving the patients that are around her. And as she loves the patients that are around her, relationships start growing they, and people start getting healed. Think about that in your own walk, in your own life right now. For many people, we are... In, Not me, I won't say that. We are in roles where we go, I don't see why God has got me here. And why are you in that role? Why are you struggling with that? It's because the concept that you're not seeing the love of the Father flow out from you yet. You might be in the place that God's got you, but you just haven't seen the areas that love is going to flow in and through your lives just yet. You might be in that place for just one encounter of love to somebody in that room that God has placed you there for. And so through that love, they'll find out that God is not this nasty God that has all these kind of rules that tries to stop you from actually living a full life. He actually find a God that actually loves on you so much that he has set you free from every wrong thing that you have done and, and declared over you that you are a daughter or a son of God. Are you following with me this morning? These concepts of my theology have shifted and changed from when I was a child to now where I am as an adult. They have shifted and changed as I've found and seen God meet me in some very difficult times in life. They have shifted and changed as I've had some brilliant times in life, like last night. We're here and a whole bunch of people are speaking in and through and over people and the people are just in joy. They're, they're, they're just allowing the Lord to just minister them and there am I standing and watching all of that happen and before you know it, you hear and you feel the Father's love and heart upon you. I had an interesting conversation this morning with Pip. Pip comes to me and says, I had a crazy story happen last night. She goes, I think I heard your guitar start speaking. It's good, right? God can use anything He wants to speak. And you guys know me long enough to know that God can speak through that plant. He can speak through the drums. He can speak through a guitar. And what did God say, Pip? Come to the river. Come to the river. Which river? Not the Parramatta River. Not the Cook River. Uh, not, Not any Mississippi River, but the river of life. What happens when you get to the river of life? The Bible says life flourishes. Life is given. Life is not taken. Life life is given. When I sit sit with people who talk about how difficult church has been for them, I hear of life being taken, not life being given. And I wish I could have the ability to rewind time and to be in that place and to love better or to love well. I want to read to you some verses this morning straight out of Mark chapter 5. And it speaks about a little bit of my understanding of of the way that I see and understand God. It's going to be up there on your screen. Uh, It says, A woman in the crowd suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She'd suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years she spent everything she had to pay them. But she'd actually gotten no better. In fact, she'd actually gotten worse. She'd heard about Jesus just from 
let that be an underlined little moment for you. She had heard about Jesus. And so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. But she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that the healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realisation of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her this, listen to the language of the king, daughter, which means you are family. Your faith, which means you have been seen, has made you well. Your faith has accomplished go in peace that is the gift that he gave to her and here's the direct declaration over her your suffering is over inside of there is my theology the father makes us family we are family you are seen the father has seen you as i see you and your faith is making you well has made you well your faith is what is restoring you go in peace and again as we said earlier the peace of god that surpasses understanding this is the peace that jesus has told us through the gospel of john that he's giving to us peace of mind peace of heart he's saying go in peace your suffering is over and that's the last we hear of this lady in scripture that story is wrapped around another story of a, of a man named by the name of Jairus who's a Pharisee and he's come to Jesus as well and said to Jesus uh, my daughter is sick can you come and heal her and Jesus said yes I'm up for that and again like I said last week when we talk about the love of Jesus the Pharisees are the ones who have been going after him going hard after him trying to trip him up in his theology or his thoughts or his teachings and here is one of them who comes to him and says my daughter is sick can you come and heal her what is the Pharisee saying there the Pharisee is saying I'm hearing what everybody else is saying but I'm seeing something different within you and I think you have the power to do something about the situation in my life where doctors can't where Pharisees can't where nobody else can I believe that there is something within you the woman who, who has been sick for 12 years she heard something about Jesus and when she heard something about Jesus it wasn't that he was nasty it wasn't that he was all about laws it, when she heard something about Jesus something drew her to him why? because she knew that in Jesus he could do something that nobody else could this is my theology and so Jesus, on the way to Jairus' home, is stopped by this woman. And, and this woman just reaches out and touches the hem of his robe. Now, I understand this. Uh, how that works theologically, how that works spiritually, how, how that works in any way, shape or form, is very interesting. Because again, it wasn't at her request. It wasn't at Jesus' spoken word. It was in Jesus' presence. And this is the thing about Christ. When he is present, which he is, things change. When faith interacts with his presence, all of a sudden lives start transforming. And we don't hear about a nasty God. We hear about a, a, a love filled, a, a God is love sort of phrase that is over this whole story. And we see a woman who is in utter desperation. Now think about this. A woman who has been bleeding like this for 12 years, the Jews would say that she has been unclean for 12 years. She has not been allowed in the temple for 12 years, which means she's been cut off from God for 12 years, which probably means to many of them that she has been cursed for 12 years. And there she is, and she's daring to walk past all of that condemnation and shame to reach out and touch somebody. Now, in the Jewish culture, if an unclean person reaches out and touches you, they get what you've got. But in this situation, she received what Jesus had. And in that conversation, Jesus doesn't just keep walking. He goes, somebody touch me. And the disciples have this meltdown moment of, you've got to be kidding, Jesus. There are literally people everywhere. And you're trying to tell us that somebody touched you. There's a lot of people who are touching you. But here's what, Je here's what Jesus said. No, no, no. I actually felt healing go out from me. What, did, what was happening right there? Jesus felt faith. Have you ever felt faith? You've come into someone in your presence and they've told you a story about their faith and you just want to believe for more. It means you've felt faith. You've felt faith. You might be even in this room this morning and listening to some of the theology that I'm actually speaking out and going, I'd like to actually believe what he's actually saying. What, uh, what is happening to you right now? You are feeling faith. Faith 
in this room is that it actually interacting with your soul and your spirit. And there's Jesus. He said, I felt faith. Somebody touched me and I, I felt faith. I felt faith. And, and so he stops. And this is what Jesus does. He doesn't let this woman just go back into the crowd. Now, in Jewish culture, first century, if you were healed, what you had to do was go to the temple and present yourself to the priests. And the priests declared that you were healed. Well, here's Jesus as the high priest. He says, no, no, I felt faith. There's been healing happening. I need to bring that person here because I'm going to declare before everybody that this woman is healed. And here's this woman. And she comes forward and shaking and trembling because she believes she might have done something wrong. And what does Jesus do? He lifts her up and declares, I have seen you. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. What is he doing? He's loving There's nobody here that can, can deny what, what has just happened is what Jesus is saying. I don't care if you're Pharisee and Jairus is standing right there. And he's probably saying to Jesus, don't stop with this woman. Keep coming, keep coming. And Jesus is like, no, no, I actually have to find this woman. I see you. I can see the faith. I felt the faith. He declares her as family. And before you know it, she's on her way in peace. The next thing, a messenger turns up and it says to Jairus, don't bother the teacher anymore, anymore. your daughter has died. Your daughter has died. If there's not a more hopeless moment in a parent's story, is to hear those words. Here's what Jesus says to Jairus. Are you ready for this? They said to, sorry, while he was speaking, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. Jesus said to him, uh, do not be afraid. Have faith. He's saying to Jairus, I want to feel your faith. I want to feel your faith. And what, what does he do? He literally restores a daughter into a family. Uh, like earlier, he said, daughter, your faith has made you well. And now he is literally restoring a daughter into family. The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at Jesus, uh, and, and he, but he made them all leave and he took the girl's father and mother and three disciples into the room where the girl was lying and holding her hand. He spoke the words, little girl, get up. And the girl who was also, she was 12 years old, and there's that number again, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. What had Jesus done? Just what he's always said that he would do. And this is our theology. And this is my theology. I believe that our Lord and Saviour is one who restores us into relationship with the Father. I believe that he restores us into relationship with each other. I, I believe that he grows the relationships that we are in right now. I believe the times that he challenges us, just like he challenged with Jairus, but at those times, he calls us forward to see and to feel the faith that we all carry. The last thing I want to say is this. In 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul says there are three things that always endure. Faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. Uh, this story of the woman and also of Jairus, they came to Jesus with faith and hope. They were willing to believe beyond what anyone else had seen or shown. With the woman, no doctor had been able to get her to the place where Jesus could get her to. With Jairus, no theology, no teaching, no scripture, no nothing could do what Jesus was doing. And so faith started to stir between two people from opposite ends of the spectrum in the first century. And both people Jesus was willing to engage with. This is my theology. It doesn't matter if you're rich. It doesn't matter if you're poor. It doesn't matter if you're hungry. It doesn't matter if you've got a lot. The whole concept of the kingdom of God is it's made for all of us. And the love of Jesus stretches to all of us. And right there, he's feeling faith. This eternal quality that he's placed in the hearts of humans, he's feeling it. He's feeling it in Jairus. He's feeling it in a woman who's been sick for 12 years. He also starts feeling hope. Now, is there anyone in the room that doesn't like feeling hope? That's one of those stupid questions, right? We all like feeling hope. And God's just saying it's a good thing you like that because it's always going to be around. 
And so whenever you say things are hopeless, like this woman who'd been sick for 12 years, I'm sure she would have said that. When, when the people came from Jairus' home and said, don't, don't bother the, the, the master now, or the teacher now, your daughter's dead, I'm sure hope would just about fizzled out of Jairus' heart. But right there, the hope that, that he'd come with, the faith that he'd come with, the hope that she had come with to reach out and touch Jesus, just the hem of his robe, the faith that she had come with is all of a sudden met with the love that he carried and the love healed the love restored the love gave the love increased the love gave more understanding I can't even possibly imagine what Jairus would have been going through after he got his daughter back what he all he'd learned was about to get exploded into the, into the universe by what he'd just seen at God in action the same with the woman who just reached out and touched his robe. Such an extraordinary moment that the love of Jesus would heal without even a word being spoken. Each of you carries something of the kingdom of God. Each of you carry his love. Each of you carries something that the Father's placed within you. It's one of the joys of my life when I sit with people to speak that into, into reality. To know that each of you carries something of the King. It's that that kind of leaks from you. As we like to say, that's what was happening with Jesus, the hem of his robe. Peter's shadow in the book of Acts just healed people, just walking past, just healed somebody. That's not a bad uh, moment in time, is it? Somebody's shadow walks past you and all of a sudden you're restored. But the concept of faith interacting with the hope, interacting with the love, and before you know it, you have a kingdom that is built on these three principles. And this is our theology. It's not about built on laws. It's about built on love and that great law of love. And what is the great law of love? Love others as I have loved you. People will know that you are my disciples by the love that you carry. It's not complicated. And as a church, we should not be making it complicated. I did a degree for four years in theology. At the end of that four years, I've learned a lot, been confused by a lot. But I do know now, above all of those things, that my God is love. And as he has loved me, he has given me that call and commission, that mandate to love other people. All the other little details, they can work themselves out. But that is the call and the great call upon our lives. Let's pray together. And Father in heaven, I just thank you for little moments of time where we can know you and speak and share your love. But Lord, it's in every other moment of time when we encounter it that just makes such a difference. And Father, this morning, I just want to pray that your love will just flow through this room. One person sitting next to another, a person sitting behind you or in front of you, that the love of Jesus will flow. That like with the woman, that healing will come. That Jesus will speak to you as, as family. That your faith will be seen and felt. That peace will be given and shared. And the declarations of what the Father has done will be done. Father, we thank you for this moment in time. May your love continue, Lord, to give us more understanding of your character. May your love change our lives. May your love change our relationships. May your love change our work environments. May your love change this world that we live in. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your input in our lives. Lord, we thank you for how you work in our lives. God, and as we go out this week, Father, I pray that this week would be a week of divine interventions. For those of us who are waiting and praying and seeking you, for questions, for answers, Lord, I pray that this week you would re reveal a little bit more to us. God, that our steps would be ordered. That our steps would be directed by you. Lord, that we would be a people that know more and more how to be led by your spirit. God, we welcome you into that place. We welcome you into that place, Father God. And as we go downstairs now and have... Um, coffee and tea. Lord, I pray that 
that new friendships will be forged today, Lord. That deeper friendships will be forged. Lord, that you would use us to uplift each other and encourage each other. God, that your work would continue as we go downstairs today. We thank you, Father, for that in your almighty name we pray. Amen.